This is an MPB Think Radio podcast. To hear previous shows, visit mpbonline.org or download the MPB Public Radio app to listen on your iPhone or Android phone on demand. Our goal at Everyday Tech is to keep your technology not only working, but working for you. I'm the host, Abram Nanny, and you can join me and my friends Wednesday mornings at 10 on MPB Think Radio. Or search Everyday Tech on your favorite podcasting app or download the MPB Public Media app. From MPB Think Radio, you're listening to Creature Comforts. It's the show all about your animals and the animals around you. Kevin Farrell here with Dr. Troy Major, veterinarian at the Animal Medical Center in Jackson, and Libby Hartfield, retired director of the Mississippi Museum of Natural Science. Mississippi's home to many different types of animals. Some fly, some swim, some creep along the ground. These creeping animals, or reptiles and amphibians, are the subject for today's show. And we're joined by conservation biologist and herpetologist at the Mississippi Museum of Natural Science, Emily Field. She'll talk about the creeping creatures that call Mississippi home and her special interest in the elusive hellbender. Or email animals at mpbonline.org. Always a reminder that if you miss Creature Comforts on Thursday morning, it repeats every Saturday morning at 6. So good morning, Libby. Let's start with you. We always like to hear what you're seeing in and around your house uh, these days. What what do you have for us today? Okay, well, uh, my birds, I guess, are the same usual suspects. The cedar waxwings and the yellow rumps and white-throated sparrows we're hearing. Uh, gosh, um, oh, I do want to mention some mammals. Um, I think I have mentioned before that Paul sometimes puts out live traps when we can tell that we're having rodents and little mammal things and uh we've um had a paramiscus yesterday they're beautiful little white-footed mouse and they can be a problem of course but they're they're um they're kind of the beatrix potter (laughs) of the mice to me you know they i i had one terrifying incident with one in my car, but I was still able to laugh because he got up on his little hind legs and looked at me and <laughs> danced around. It was kind of <laughs> unbelievable. But uh, they are adorable little things. And uh, then I read the other day that their preferred food is the larvae of gypsy moths. Hmm. So and gypsy moths are, are a, a pretty big pest for lumber. So I thought, well, that's a pretty good plus for them. But anyway, um, paramiscus is a really neat little animal. If you can avoid having them in your house and simply see them around your place, it's pretty good. And Paul just moved this one to the woods. We even had to pick a a specially nice place that we felt like, okay, this little guy can stay warm and he won't be in Paul's shop anymore. Hmm. So hopefully we saved his life. And I guess when you're talking about mice, maybe because the paramiscus are out, this is the best time in the world to hear owls mm. and to even see them. If you um, check the the bird watching and the f- outdoor photography sites on, on Facebook, everybody's got owls this week. And um, I've, I think I've heard them every night, even that rainy night. And so if you'd like to introduce your children to the sounds of owls, now while it's getting dark early is a great time to get little kids outside. You may have to bundle up these next few days, but that's kind of a fun part of it too, and get outside and listen for the owls. Uh, Great horned owls and barred owls are probably what you're most likely to hear. And, um, but every now and then a barn owl. That's kind of, at our house at least, that's what. We went from having predominantly barred owls, as many places have, to having more great horned, and I think that's still kind of an unexplained um, expansion of great horned owls. But they, they're one of those animals, and we may have even mentioned them when we were talking with Adam Ronke, that's an animal that lives perfectly well around people. And so they're tending to be more great horned owls, I guess, as there are more of us. So um, I was doing my walk in the the park in Pearl the other day, and I don't know what, I think it was a hawk of some sort, but it kind of swooped by me in front of me and, you know, went off to a tree or whatever. And I thought to myself, boy, if I were some little creature, that thing, well, I was kind of spooked at being a big creature. So you can imagine what the prey feels like when when it's being swooped on. But that was, it was very majestic as it went by there. So that was kind of a thrill. Maybe a cooper's hawk? I, um, I, 
I'm, it, I'm very bad but at it. But anyway, it, yeah. was, it went fast, and it was pretty quiet, and yeah. it was close to you. That would be my guess immediately in my environment is that it's a cooper's hawk. But, yeah, that's a, a deadly thing for a little paramiscus <laughs> on the ground there. Or um, coopers really like birds. So if you're a, um, a morning dove, you got to watch out on that. You know, Cooper's and, hawk is around. So the other thing is we often talk sometimes about how birds get named. A lot of times it's the descriptions. And, you know, I think my favorite example is the lesser turn and how, you know, they must feel slighted by called a lesser something. <laughs> yeah. But what about cedar wax wings? Are the, is their wings appear to be waxy? <laughs> they Well, and they do hang out in cedar trees. They like okay. those, those strange little berries on a cedar. Those, But um, their wings are really cool in that they have these little touches of very vibrant color and it looks as though and you know at one time wax was a very daily thing that people dealt with because you used candles it looks like a little bit of red wax has been dripped on their uh, uh, wings a couple of places and then right at the end of the tail there is just it looks like it's applied, na- uh, I would say, enamel nowadays because, you know, that's what we get. But I guess wax would have been that way. But it's a very vibrant little band of yellow that almost appears to have texture to it hmm. because it's so so glossy. And even though those are little tiny pops of color, they have a real neat little mask and all kinds of neat things about their body. Those little pops of color, I guess, were so unusual that that's what they called them. Well, I give the bird naming folks some some props because, like I say, it's always fun to try to figure out you know how they got that name and that sort of thing. Yeah. So. Uh, Dr. Troy Major joins us from his clinic in Jackson, as he does each Thursday. Good morning, Dr. Major. We're going to be talking about uh, herpetology today. Do you encounter many reptiles or amphibians uh, at the clinic? We encounter a few. Uh, uh, there are some, you know, not not a whole lot lately, but there are some box turtles that uh, people have. Uh, cared for well and uh, seem to do well and as long as you're taking care of them keeping them at this time of year they some of them tend to hibernate even though they're inside and uh, they do quite well Uh, we haven't seen many of the iguanas lately that sort of thing which is probably a good thing Uh, an occasional snake uh, we also see um, what about if someone were to bring in a non-domesticated animal that they've found? And uh, it, well, first of all, I mean, are you a welcoming place? Do you have the resources if someone brings in an, an injured wild animal that you could help them maybe steer in the right direction of, of a rehabber or that sort of thing? Certainly. And we can uh, try to locate rehabbers, whether it's a, a bird or a uh, mammal. Uh, and certainly the turtles, there's a very active turtle. Uh, rescue group, and uh, these are things that uh, you know, certainly we can direct uh, people to give immediate care, and then hopefully a rehabber is available that can, can help take care of them. And let me remind us, if, if you come across a wild animal in the, you know, out and about and you want to try to do something, what are some things to keep in mind? I know one of them is, you know, maybe avoid touching it. Uh, so what would be some common sense things to, to keep in mind if you're trying to help out an injured wild animal? Yeah, if you're, if you're pretty sure it's injured, try to first off assess, is it really injured or is it having some weird behavior because of you being there stressing it? But um, they say don't try to give it any food or water. Uh if if it's something small enough like a, a turtle or a bird or, you know, anything that's mobile, if you can put it in a box or inside of a, a, a container kind of so that it feels hidden is a good thing to do for it. That's less stressful. If picking something up, holding it and looking at it a whole lot and photographing it a whole lot is going to be stressful, but probably none of us can resist taking a quick picture with our cell phones. So, yeah, but you know, don't me, overdo let, that part. Yeah. yeah. Let me those yeah. of us that would stop and try to help an injured animal. It's always good to have maybe a, a blanket or some towels yeah. in your in your vehicle so that you can uh, handle those and maybe some gloves as well. Because if you have whether it's a domesticated animal that's been hit by a car or something else uh, it may be good to have actually just a pair of gloves also. Mm-hmm. But these are things that you should travel with if you're going to stop and try to give aid. 
Yeah, and and do I know, Troy? We've both talked about this before. You know, be be mindful of your own safety. An, an injured animal can bite, or you know, or even a bird can hurt you and lash out when they're in pain. You can understand, and also, of course, be really careful of where you are. Is it a safe place for you to stop and help an animal? Uh, exactly. The other thing, remember, our rehabber mentions to us, and I'm looking at it on my phone right now. I had to pull it up to see. It's just a, a, an app called Animal Help, and I've used it a couple of times now, and it. Um, you know, it's a, a smart computer somewhere, I guess, but it anywhere you are, it will tell you where the closest rehabbers oh, okay. are that, that are registered with, <clears throat> with them. But it's been pretty accurate for me, and it, it gives you somebody to call, and it will give you several, you know, and it'll tell you how far away each, each one is. So it's just called Animal Help, and um, you, I've, I've downloaded it for that kind of a situation. All right. As I mentioned, our guest is Emily Field. She's a conservation biologist and herpetologist with the Mississippi Museum of Natural Science. Emily, thanks for agreeing to be on the show with us this morning. Thank you for having me. So what does the herpetologist do at the museum? Well, I would say what I love about working at the museum is how varied my days are. I really am doing one of three things at any given time, field work or office work or curating. Um, my favorite days are definitely those where I'm outside in the field actively conducting research. And the great thing about herpetology is how many species I get to work with. And they all have different active seasons, different breeding seasons, which means I really get to be in the field on and off throughout the year. But typically in the summers, I am working with reptiles such as snakes and most often turtles. Typically that's going to be from late spring to midsummer. That is really the best time to work with these because that's their breeding season. And so it's great to work with things during their breeding season because that's when they're on the move. You know, they're out and about, they're foraging, they're looking for mates, they're trying to nest. And so when they're on the move like that, it makes it a lot easier for us to catch them. But you also have to remember that we're working with threatened, endangered, rare species. Their reproduction is something that's important for population health. So it also allows us to get some information about their reproductive habits and overall health. Um, after the field season, I'm in the office doing things like data entry, data analysis, uh, mapping, writing up technical reports and pop, uh, publications. It's maybe not the most glamorous part of the job, but it's very important. Mm -hmm. And then the really unique thing about the museum is that I get to do curations work. You know, we have a lot of people come to the museum who come for our exhibits, which are amazing. And a lot of times they don't know about the collections we house behind the scenes. So a major part of my job is managing the herpetology collection, which can look like preserving specimens, um, making sure that the specimens we do have are stored correctly. And my favorite is when I get to work with other researchers and help them collect data from our collection for their own research. So where does your interest in herpetology come from? I think my backstory is probably a lot like other biologists. I grew up outside being a little bit feral. Um, if it was <laughs> after school, uh, on the weekends, in the summer, I was in the neighborhood creek, the neighborhood pond, tromping around the woods. I've just always loved being outside and getting dirty. Uh, but I really have to say that I think I have to credit my mom to my love of wildlife because she's the one that first of all, taught me to tromp around in the creek, but then also taught me to look closer and look for the life in the creek. She taught me to notice the crayfish and the minnows and the frogs, and she even helped me collect tadpoles from the neighborhood pond and helped me raise them into tiny little frogs. Um, I knew I wanted to go to college. I knew that I wanted to be a scientist from the time I was in elementary school. Sometime around high school, I had a horrible teacher, and I decided that I wasn't cut out for it. I wasn't smart enough. I wasn't good enough at math. I couldn't do science. So I went to college as a film major. One semester decided that was not a viable career option, <laughs> um, and through a series of <clears throat> events, changed my major to biology, remembering how much I loved it. I... Uh, got involved in a research lab at the University of Central Arkansas, working with uh, eastern collared lizards, which, in my professional opinion, are probably the coolest lizard in North America. They're pretty amazing. Um, and then I went on to do my master's at Arkansas State University, where I studied immunity, reproduction, and the stress response in water snakes. After that, the herpetologist position here opened up, and here I am. 
you know, it was interesting. I, I like what you said about the fact that your your mother was the one that helped you kind of slow down and, and take a closer look. And I know that in Mississippi, much like in Arkansas, we're blessed with just abundant natural resources. And I think even I've learned to, uh, when I'm walking in the park, to, to, to again, to slow down and, and observe things. Based on our converse, my conversation with Libby, I'm still not looking closely enough because I'm not sure what I'm seeing. Yeah. But it would be a way for maybe parents when they're out with their kids to encourage that closer study to maybe, Absolutely. you know, develop an interest. Mm-hmm. As we mentioned in the opener of the show, one of your favorite or one of the animals you think is, is really interesting. And from what I've heard of reading through the script here, very elusive. So if you would tell us a little bit about a hellbender. So the hellbender, which, by the way, has many names, my personal favorite being the snot otter, um, <laughs> is a large aquatic salamander, and it is an incredibly sensitive species. They have highly specific habitat requirements. They need rocky, clean, cool, clear, fast-flowing, highly oxygenated water. It's a very specific set of needs, so there aren't a lot of places where they can live happily because... They just need a lot of factors to be just right. Um, The only place we really see them in Mississippi is in the northeast corner of the state in the foothills of the Appalachians. And it's a big deal to find one because this is a species that's rapidly declining throughout its range throughout the entire U.S. Um, Its abundance or the number of individuals has decreased an estimated 70 percent since the 1970s. So there's a lot of work going on to save the hellbender as we like to say but it's it's a very it's a rare species it's exciting to see one is <clears throat> what are the reasons for the the decline loss of habitat i think is usually one of when we talk about animals that are endangered what about with the hellbender there are a number of factors that have contributed to the decline um, the most obvious being water quality so hellbenders are really interesting because they lose their gills when they become adults. They don't have gills, but they live in the water their entire life. And so they breathe through their skin, which is some other, there are some other salamander species that do that, but that's why they need that highly oxygenated water. They need that to pass over them so it can absorb into their skin and into their bloodstream. That also makes them really sensitive to environmental disturbances. So if you've got, say, fertilizers or pesticides leaching into the streams that's going to get into the water that's going to affect a lot of animals but it'll affect them even more severely and then changes to things like stream morphology um like i said they need that fast flowing water typically in kind of shallower areas if something say like an impoundment is created that can completely change the stream flow regime from something that's fast flowing and shallow to something that's deeper and slower and is not going to work for them at all Um, And then, you know, something that listeners can do to help them is to help hellbenders and other species is when you're in the stream, when you're in the river, just appreciating it for what it is and leaving it alone is something that's a really big deal. You know, you see people building these rock cairns and stuff and they're beautiful, but it does come at the cost of harming native species because there are many species that lay their eggs under these rocks. If you move them, you can destroy nests, you can destroy babies, you can injure adults. So... There's a whole myriad of factors that go into it. So if you would describe what the hellbenders look like. So as I said, they're called the snot otter. They're not maybe the most beautiful animal, but they're cute in their own way, I would say. Um, (laughs) They are actually the largest amphibian in North America. They can grow up to two feet long, which is kind of enormous for a salamander. They're going to be a really dark brown, kind of a mottled brownish grayish green color. And uh, another name for them is the lasagna lizard because they have these skin folds on their sides that I swear they look like lasagna. I encourage your (laughs) listeners to go Google a picture of them and they'll understand what I mean. Um, They're very flattened because they like to hide under rocks. So they're just they're kind of just a weird looking animal. What about their diet? Mainly they eat crayfish. They do eat some frogs and fish, but crayfish make up the main bit of their diet. Now, there actually has been a historical misconception that they eat tons and tons and tons of fish. And so historically, they were actually hunted and there were bounties on them for fishermen to collect them and kill them so that they wouldn't eat the fish. Now, this is not really a thing anymore. Please don't go out and kill hellbenders. I promise they're not eating your fish. Um, But occasionally... Anglers do still catch them on their lines. It's not as common anymore since they're so rare, but it does happen. 
if this did happen to a listener, um, I would recommend please take a picture of it and send it to us. But go ahead and just release it back into the water. Cut the line as close as you can to the mouth. Don't try to remove the hook. It can injure an individual even worse. Um, but let it go. Take a picture and let us at the museum know. We won't be mad at you. I promise we'll just be really excited you found one. <laughs> Kevin Farrell here with Dr. Troy Major, veterinarian at the Animal Medical Center in Jackson, Libby Hartfield, retired director of the Mississippi Museum of Natural Science, and our guest for the hour is Emily Fields, a herpetologist. And we're talking about uh, hellbenders part- particularly, and this is Creature Comforts on MPB Think Radio. If you missed any of today's show, you can always subscribe to the podcast using your favorite podcasting app, or if you download the MPB Public Media app for your smartphone, you have access to all the local MPB Think Radio programs on your schedule. <clears throat> so, um, Emily, we've talked about how elusive uh, the hellbender is, and so if you could maybe just briefly speak about the challenges of studying an animal that's kind of hard to find. So hellbenders, yeah, it's uh, they're hard to find when you're looking for them. If you're not looking for them, you're never going to see them. But they are just a very secretive species. They spend their life in the water. They're extremely well camouflaged, and they mostly hide out. They look for really big, flat rocks. They have specific rock needs, too, because they're very specific animals. And these rocks are enormous. Sometimes they're just boulder-sized. And so... For a long time, we just didn't know anything about their reproduction. We didn't know anything about the larvae because it was either impossible to lift up these rocks to find them when they're breeding and they have their nests, or if you did, you would destroy the nests. So up until recent technological advances, we just didn't really know anything. But there are things we can do now, like putting out what we call nest boxes. They kind of mimic the rocks they need, but they're easy for us to lift. Um, And it creates more habitat for them to have their nests in. It makes less competition among the males because they get very competitive, very aggressive when they're defending their nest rocks. Um, So a lot of it is just understanding their habits and their needs and coming up with ways that we can take advantage of those needs in a way that works for us. Uh, have there been some recent sightings of the hellbender in, uh, hellbender in Mississippi? Yes. So until last year, the last hellbender seen in Mississippi was in 2015. Oh, wow. There is one very specific spot, very small spot in Mississippi where they're found. And it was an adult male found there. We've named him Hector. Um, but last year, our aquatic biologists at the museum were out doing fish surveys, and they pulled up a larval salamander in their net. Now, to be fair, we get larval salamanders in our nets all the time. There are tons and tons of really common species that start their lifespan in the water. Um, but these guys are mussel and fish experts. They did not know what they were looking at, so they wanted a confirmation on the identity. So they called me and two other experts at the museum, and we're looking at this thing, and it was just silent. The three of us are just standing there silently, and at least in my head, and I'm sure in their heads too, I'm thinking, that's a hellbender, but there's no way that's a hellbender. (laughs) It was just one of those things where my eyes were telling me one thing, and my brain was telling me, there's no way you're seeing this. I mean, I didn't think I would ever see a hellbender in my lifetime. Um, But it was. We keyed it out, and it was a hellbender, and we consulted with experts in the coming months, um, and it was indeed a hellbender. We've actually uh, submitted a publication for this. It's in review right now. Hopefully it gets published soon in the next couple of months. Um, It was really exciting because, one, it was a hellbender. You know, we hadn't seen one in almost a decade. But maybe even more exciting is that it was a larvae, um, which means – There's a mom and a dad out there somewhere, and they're reproducing successfully. And the larvae are, they're hatching, they're getting out there, and this one was about five to six months old based on how big it was. So they're surviving for a while. So it means that there's recruitment happening. And another really exciting thing was that this was a brand new locality. Like I said, we only find hellbenders in this one very specific place. This was not in that place. So maybe they're in other places and that's just going to take more research but it was a really exciting discovery and so the increase in sightings i'm guessing is good news absolutely absolutely so with uh, hellbenders being so rare uh do you advise people to go out and try to find them or is that not such a good idea that's maybe not the best idea um i can't tell people where to go find them because that would be 
pretty unethical on my part. This is a very sensitive species, and they are at risk of poaching. There is a bit of a market for them uh, in other countries. But I can tell people that if they're willing to make the trek, they could go up to the St. Louis Zoo and see a hellbender on exhibit. I have seen the one they have, and it was a very exciting moment for me. Mm-hmm. It was very cute. Um, but the St. Louis Zoo is actually one of the leaders in hellbender conservation. They have partnered with their state herpetologist uh, to work on a head starting program, which basically means they go out, they find hellbender nests in the wild, and they take the eggs and they bring them back to the zoo and they rear them in captivity. You know, when you're a little baby, you're just a little larva, you're very vulnerable to everything and it's very easy to die. Um, So they take them back and they raise them, get them through that really vulnerable stage and when they're a little bit older, they're not going to die as easily. They can, you know, kind of fend for themselves. They'll release them back into the wild. And this program has been a huge success. It's been really exciting. There are other head starting programs in other states and so... You can see one at the St. Louis Zoo, but you can also see the kind of work that they're doing to conserve this species. Uh, Being a big fan of the zoos, I've been to the St. Louis Zoo a couple of times. And if you are going in that uh, area and are looking for things to do, I would certainly put that. At least it would be very high on my list of things to do. That's Mm -hmm. for sure. It's amazing. So you mentioned nest. What sort of a nest do these hellbenders have? Hellbenders have... Some of the coolest reproduction, I think, and, you know, I'm someone who thinks about reproduction a lot, so it gets exciting for me, but they will nest under really big, specific rocks. They need a big, flat rock, and hellbenders are what we call the stay-at-home dads of the herp world. The dad is the one that takes care of the nest, so in the late summer to mid-fall, dad is going to go out. He's going to start searching for a good rock to have a nest under. There aren't maybe a lot of these rocks because, as I said, they're very specific. That's why those nest boxes are helpful. So if another male comes along, they get very aggressive defending their nest. They're going to get it nice and ready, and when the time is right, they're going to lure a female in and spawn with her. Another really interesting thing about hellbenders is that they reproduce through external fertilization, which means mom lays her eggs, and then she leaves. She's done. Her job is done. She goes back out into the world. Dad fertilizes them, and then he takes care of the nest until the eggs hatch. So he's going to stay there. He's going to fan them with his tail to make sure they're oxygenated, and he's going to care for them. Now, something fascinating, if not maybe a little bit creepy, is that hellbenders display something called filial cannibalism, which means sometimes dad gets a little hungry, and he'll have a little egg snack. (laughs) (laughs) A little bit weird for us, not something we do, um, but this is very it's a normal behavior for them. That said, there was a study that came out recently and it was a really big deal for help under conservation because they found that in deforested areas, this behavior is much more common and dad will eat so many eggs that it leads to chronic nest failure. So that's part of the reason they're not reproducing while they're not having a lot of success. So we're finding that the better an area is, the more uh, pristine it is, the better the hellbenders are going to do. We don't know why they're eating so many eggs, but uh, it's a step in the right direction for, you know, it's another piece of the puzzle. The larvae, if they make it, if dad doesn't eat all of them while they're still an egg, um, they go off, they do their little larvae thing. Turns out they need very different habitat needs than the adults, so you're going to find them in places where you would not find an adult. They are terrible at swimming. They're really bad at it. They just get washed downstream immediately. So while the adults are looking for fast moving water, the little babies are gonna be in still pools looking for cover like submerged logs. And then I guess, do they have an ability to swim that as they grow older? Yes, as they get bigger, they have um, a really powerful tail. So as they get bigger, they get a lot better at swimming. It's just when they're in that really vulnerable little baby life stage that they just, they can't do it. And again, I think you, we talked earlier, you mentioned that they can grow up to as long as, as two feet. Is, yes. that, is that mostly the comments? I mean, so are the, if, if you were to see one, this is a fairly large creature. If you were to see one, yeah, it, you could see it from a couple of inches to probably one, one and a half feet is a little more common. A two-footer would be one that you'd find in a really good habitat with pretty good population recruitment. I don't know if we'd see that here. Um, I don't remember how big Hector was, but he was pretty sizable. How old do you think they are when they're that big? They can live up to 30 years. Um, So when they get that big, somewhere between 15, 20, 30 years. Uh, If you would tell us about some hellbender research that's currently going on. Yeah, so since finding that larvae, we have uh, 
explored that stream further. We've gotten with another researcher in the state who has extensive hellbender experience. He and his students always go out and do the typical nest surveys in the summer. They go to this one specific area where we find them and they look for nests. And so we've worked with him to determine if there are areas in the stream that might be good for adults. We floated a good stretch of that stream. Looks like there's really only two spots maybe that looked good for adults. A lot of good larvae spots though. So we're going to do further surveys there. We're hoping to also have some eDNA surveys done in the future where they take water samples and look for hellbender DNA in that water sample in some of the surrounding streams and tributaries because you know, up until now, they'd only been found in that one stream. Now we know that they're outside of that stream. Where else might they be? So there's a lot, lot going on in the future. So if someone's listening and is interested in, in hellbenders, what are some places they could go, things or, you know, resources that they could use to try to learn more about them? Google's always a great resource, um, but, you know, make sure you're looking at reputable sources. Um, the Orient Society is great. They have a lot of great information. Um, Fish and Wildlife. You can look at things like, again, St. Louis Zoo. And most of the state departments, Virginia, North Carolina, Indiana, these are places where hellbenders are very common. They tend to have lots of information on them as well. Um, so I think earlier in the show we talked about that they breathe through the water. So do they ever come out on land or can they come out briefly and then back in the water? You don't really see them come out on land. They are going to stay in the water pretty much all the time. So um, we've mentioned that uh, it's not a good idea for the folks to go you know, out in the wild looking for these. But is there a role that uh, people um, could play in hellbender research? Absolutely. Um, at least in helping conserve the species, there are lots of things people can do. And a lot of these things are going to help more animals than just the hellbender. They're going to help lots of our native species. Keeping our waterways clean is something really valuable that people can do. And so think about all the things that run off from our yards into the stormwater drains. Um, that water goes back into our river systems. So if you're using fertilizers or pesticides, anything like that, that can leach into our waterways. If you have some kind of buffer between your yard and the storm drain, that can help a lot. Some kind of, we call it a riparian buffer around creeks and rivers, just lots of trees and natural areas. But even just having plants and flowers, that kind of thing can help you know, have that water soak back into the soil before getting into the waterways. And then, again, just keeping our riverways clean. We have Pearl River cleanups every once in a while, volunteering with that kind of stuff, and just really educating yourselves, getting the word out there, because a lot of people don't know about this species. Um, so spread the word. Spread the word. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> we do have a caller on the line. Uh, so let's go to Coleman, who calls in from Columbus. Good morning. You're on the air with us, so go ahead. Uh, well, um, I have this little creature on my sticky trap, and I'm not sure it's under herpetology or not, but it's a, he's uh, probably about a little over an inch long. He, he looks like a tiny alligator almost, but he bends, you know, he kind of have a swivel to him, uh, his long tail that's speckled, and um, his his mouth and area looks like a tiny, tiny alligator. Uh, I took a picture, but I'm not sure how to send it to you. You can send the picture to, if you have an email account, send it to animals at mpbonline.org. Okay. But yeah, we'd love it. We'd love to get that, and we can uh, actually, uh, you know, we can get it to Emily at the museum, and we can help you try to identify w what you got there. Yeah, it seems yeah, like well. it's bound to be a lizard or a salamander. It sure oh. sounds like a lizard to me. Yeah. Does does the skin? When you're saying it looks like an alligator, does the skin? Is it rough and, um, or is it slick and smooth and kind of slimy? <laughs> he, he's brown. Okay. And uh, like I said, its tail is uh, speckled, and um, his little hands has uh, five five uh, digits. Um, <laughs> he's kind of uh, modeled, I guess you might say, 
that's a good word for it. Okay. Mm-hmm. I would brown. I would need to see a picture to know for sure, but based on your description, it sounds a bit like a fence lizard. But again, I don't know for sure unless I would. I was looking at it. Yeah, that's what. If, I don't know if you want to. Do you still have it, or is this something that? Yeah, yeah, I've got. Some, uh, yeah, I do have it. It's on my sticky trap. Would you be willing to touch its back and see what it felt like? Does it? Is it kind of? Uh, well, <laughs> that's a lot to ask for. Really. Yeah, that, that's a, <laughs> yeah. Trying to yeah. tell if it's a fence lizard, it's going to be kind of rough and mm-hmm. a harder back. Uh, so, and with the sticky traps, when you get animals like that that you maybe don't want stuck in the trap, you maybe want to re-release them, you can use an oil like vegetable oil to free them from it and let them go on their way. Okay. Uh, but, Coleman, if you do have that picture, you know, if you would, email it to us, and we'll see what we can't uh, find out for you. But, again, it's animals, plural, at mpbonline.org. And we appreciate your phone call. Uh, let's stay on the line. Our next caller looks like it's a question for Dr. Major, and it's coming from Kelly in Bahalia. Good morning, Kelly. You're on the air with us. Go ahead. <laughs> Good morning. I'm calling from Bahalia. Okay. That's how you say that. <laughs> I was just wondering if there are any kinds of vegetables that you shouldn't feed dogs. So um, yeah. any, any vegetables you should not feed your dog? Well, that's a great question. Um, they they love green beans. Most dogs do. Uh, carrots, uh, and of course, fruits. You know, not to feed the grapes uh, and asparagus. Uh, some dogs like like asparagus. So, a lot of it has to do with the individual dog. I would say that uh, there may be some that uh, individual dogs will have an upset stomach about from, but uh, they can do pretty well with most of the vegetables. And is it, with the upset stomach, I guess you're if you're trying to get your dog to eat a new vegetable, obviously feed it in small portions and see what the reaction is first before you go there. But is that a healthy part of a dog's diet? Can be a healthy part of a dog's diet? Yes, it can. Uh, dogs are not strict carnivores and certainly are opportunists. I know that uh, in, in the wild... Uh, they will eat any types of fruits. Uh, maybe uh, if they could find potatoes or something like that, they would eat those, dig those up and eat them, and other types of roots that are grown in the wild. But uh, in most cases, I don't think we're seeing a problem from uh, our pets or domesticated dogs having problems with vegetables. All right. All right, Kelly, we appreciate you calling in this morning. Let's uh, get one more phone call in here, and so we'll go to Madison. Mary has called in today. Good morning, Mary. Go ahead, please. Good morning. Um, I have a question about how I can help the wild birds during extreme cold weather events. Remember about three years ago we had snow on the ground, freezing cold, never got above freezing for like a week. And um, the bluebirds in particular would just like fall out on the ground and I would pick them up, put them in a shoebox, put them in my mud room till they warmed up again and then I would release them. And I just wondered, is there anything I can do that can help them or any wild birds when we have weather events like that? Yeah, uh, for one thing, that is when they do need water. For sure you need to give them water. And uh, you know, when everything's frozen, that can be difficult for them. Uh, bluebirds particularly at that time I mean I had a pair that died in my yard in their bluebird box you know they'd done what they could do and um, we did have water out but um, yeah I've worried about that too this next week is going to be rough for them so the main thing is to thaw some water you know if you boil water or whatever don't put it out when it's terribly hot but um you know when it's it, you know while it's still a little bit warm, that can help. And be sure that there is food. If you know if it's a, if it's, there's seed eating birds around, they they'll eat some food. But um, I I I wish there were more. If and if any other caller has thought of anything else they could do, uh, I've heard people say they open their garage and let birds go in there when it's really cold outside. If you can do something like that, that might possibly help. It would be just a little bit less cold. 
All right, to Mary, um, thanks. Go ahead. No, I was just going to say I was amazed to see how many bluebirds would pack into a bluebird house. Yes. I mean, clown cars. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yeah, yeah. And that just broke my heart. We, you know, there was a researcher there at Ole Miss, and it pretty much ruined her study. And that's, she said that it just broke her heart. She would open a, a box, and there would be eight and ten birds packed in there, but still they didn't make it. All right, Mary, thanks for calling in this morning. This is Creature Comforts on MPB Think Radio, visiting today with Emily Field. Emily, got about a minute and a half left. If you could briefly give us an idea of what research project you've got going on this summer. Yeah, this summer I'll be working with the Alabama red belly turtle. It's um, a fairly large turtle on the coast of Mississippi. This is one of the most endangered freshwater turtles in North America because it just has such a restricted range. It's really only in that corner of Mississippi and a little bit in Alabama. So um, we are working on a survey, kind of working with the Alabama Department of Wildlife as well, separate but together, to survey them throughout their range and uh, see how they're doing. We haven't had a full-on survey probably since the 90s. Um, So it's, it's, you know, it's, it's listed as an endangered species, so it certainly needs an update. So we'll be serving for those and hopefully in the future doing some reproductive studies to understand if they're still able to nest successfully. All right. About a minute left. We've talked about hellbenders, one of your favorites. What uh, Do you have another favorite uh, species to study or uh, an amphibian or a reptile? I have so many favorites. But, <laughs> uh, my favorite snake would have to be the hog nose because they're just so dramatic. They have the cutest little upturned noses. And um, in the wild, they don't do this in captivity, but in the wild when they are trying to avoid a predator, something's scaring them, stressing them out. They have a really fun little defense mechanism where they do a really dramatic death spiral, basically. They flip onto their back, belly up, tongue hanging out, and they (laughs) writhe around like they're dying dramatically. And you can take them and flip them back over, right side up, and they'll flip right back over. Like, no, 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 I'm dead. I think that's the first on Creature Comfort, someone called a snake cute. That's interesting. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> All right. That's going to wrap us up for today. Creature Comforts is a production of Mississippi Public Broadcasting Think Radio. To hear today's show or a previous show, you can search for Creature Comforts on your favorite podcasting app or download the MPB Public Media app for your smartphone. Our show is produced and engineered by Abram Nanny, and our call screener today was Charles Arnold. So for Dr. Troy Major, Libby Hartfield, and our guest Emily Field, I'm Kevin Farrell, inviting you to stay tuned because up next at 10, it's AutoCorrect with Coach Charlie Milton. We'll be back next Thursday at 9 for another Creature Comforts. It's heard only on MPB Think Radio. This is an MPB Think Radio podcast. To hear previous shows, visit mpbonline.org or download the MPB Public Radio app to listen on your iPhone or Android phone on demand.